1. I was in my first full-time job for five years. I liked it. I worked overtime weekly and I had no problem with it. The company was producing bank backend systems and my job was to test its quality and deploy it to the customer's site. Today this is normally a job for two plus people. We deliver to several banks and any of us would deliver to a bank if needed. I worked on three. One local and two in different countries, different time zones, plus five and minus three hours. If you were lucky, you deliver to three banks a day, and delivery to the bank meant that you would wait till the end of business hours at the bank. If the bank was unable to warn customers ahead of time, you would wait until all the customers logged out, then set maintenance and deliver the update. Install, test, and set everything into production, labels and so on. If you worked on patches, it meant you were to deliver at 3pm, 8pm, and 11pm, in my case. In our team, we planned to do it during work time and sometimes from home, if the time of leaving the building might be too late for us. We had a policy that if we worked too late, we were entitled to come in later the next day. The policy being like, between your yesterday shift and today shift, there must be at least 12 hours. And as expected, our company had its own business hours from 9am to 3pm. And every day you have to work for 8 hours, plus your free time in which you can leave for lunch. That may not be longer than 30 minutes, and no earlier than after 4 hours of the previous log time in the office system. Your data would be collected from a wall device that read your badge. If somebody opened the doors for you, your badge wasn't lodged. By the way, our company doesn't pay overtime. Our department was working on developing a new bank with a very famous guy at that time. And in the end, he took all the colleagues dedicated to the project for his own, and caused a lot of trouble in our team, department, and whole company. We lost our main architect and all the most experienced guys. So in that day, I was the most experienced guy for all the banks in the blink of an eye. Our new department manager decided to send an email. Oh, in the terrible circumstances, please, if you have any idea how to help us stabilize the product, let me know. I was young and dumb. I replied saying that only I know all the information on how to properly deploy to the high-budget customers, and I wanted to share that knowledge, and if needed I could mentor others. Basically, I was the most experienced. Now, I'm a good fit to grow into a manager position too. I never got an email back, and nobody was talking to me. The next month we got a new manager, without any word. The new manager was a Karen-like woman in her early thirties and she actively started to make one-to-one -one greetings with everybody in our reduced team. I was the last one. Hi, LP. How are you? Hi, Karen. I'm fine. And you? Well, I'm fine, but I think you will not be. Why? I looked at your presence, and you do not work eight hours a day. Only in the last week you worked oof, one day, only four hours. Today you arrived at 12 p.m. May I continue? Well... You can continue, if you want, but what's it all about? You're aware that I work from home to deliver to the customer site sometimes. And, same as I worked only four hours one day, I worked 16 the previous one, because it was needed. No proof, no logs from your badge. If you worked and time is not logged, you didn't work. Long story short, you are incompetent. You do not deliver good work and we will penalize you over your less work hours. And by the way, no, you are not allowed to work from home anymore. Well, okay. And the problem is? You have to arrive at the workplace before 9am, and you have to stay for 8 hours. Well, I mostly do. At Monday I arrived at 7am and left at 3pm. Which is exactly 8 hours, isn't it? Well, uh, that is not correct. You have to have a lunch break, according to the Republic law, and you must have it for a maximum of 30 minutes, so you're allowed to leave at 3.30pm. Okay, I had no lunch, but yes, I will do next time. Sure, sure, you will. So do you have any questions? No, do you? No, I just have one more notice for you. You may consider your leave, because with all the timesheet reports, we can press charges and downgrade your salary and fire you. Oh, really? Sure we can, and I will happily sign your resignation. Or may I write it for you? No, it's fine. I'll try my best to comply with the law. Okay, you're on probation period again. 
and the malicious compliance starts here. The next day I arrived at 6.30, took a 30 minute break, and left at 3pm. I stay exactly by the on-wall device to touch my badge to it to be logged properly. I did it for a week, and then the product manager approaches me. We had had occasional difficult times. In person he was very good. It's just that he tried to squeeze the timesheets as much as possible to get work done. Banks are very strong in their decisions that something is mandatory and should be done ASAP, or they will not pay more money to the contract. ALP, uh, today is a patch for a bank. Uh, at 11pm everything is prepared. Uh, today will be delivered a small fix for a small issue. So just test it and deploy by the customer, can you? Well, I can test it, but since I arrived at 6.30am, I will be leaving at 3pm. And I am not allowed to work from home according to my new manager, Karen. There is nothing more I can do for you. Uh, this is BS you have to deliver. Uh, nobody else can do it here. What do I do? What will I tell the customer? I don't know. I'm not allowed to do this as I'm on probation. PM looked at me, shocked, and left. An hour later, PM approached me again, asking if I changed my mind. I told him again, there's nothing I can do, since I have to comply with Karen's new rules. Another hour later, 2 PM, I was approached by PM and Karen. OP, can you repeat what you said to me? Well, I said I'm not allowed to stay longer in the office, and I'm not allowed to work from home according to my probation period, set by Karen. And if I work and time is not logged, I didn't work. That is not true. You have to stay here between 9am to 3pm, and do your job at least 8 hours a day, so you have 2 more hours to spend. And if PM needs you, you have to comply and deliver the patch. Okay, uh, the time the patch is at? 11pm. Since I'm not allowed to work from home, and I arrived at 6.30am, I don't see any time window left for me to get it done today. Well, that may look that way, but you must comply and deliver. But it will contradict my probation. How? You're on probation because you do less work than you should. Well, I told you I work on delivering patches from home, and it takes two hours of work, and it is in the time frame of our business hours, so I don't see any way to get it done, since I can only work from the office. And I really don't see it as right to sit here from 11pm to 1am the next day to deliver to the customer and be here the next day at 9am because I will miss my sleep. And that will violate the employment policies in our country. I can make an exception. Well, you're not allowed to make exceptions to the law and as you know, you're not allowed to force me to work overtime since the company does not pay overtime. And the overtime is like 25% up and the night shift is another 25% up. If I count it, can you write me the resignation letter you offered to write? What? Well, yes, I can write it, but we have important things to do now. Well, consider this me saying no to your generous offer of exceptions. Since I have a life to live outside of this office, and it's now 2.58pm, and I have to go shut my computer down and leave. Just to make sure I make it on time, as dictated by the law, so we stay out of penalties. The next day I went to HR with some papers to sign around 7am. Why are you leaving? Are you one of those new bank bastards? No, I am not. I am just one not working bastard, as Karen said. She's the one that made me think about quitting. And since I'm such a big disappointment for your company, because if I work and time's not logged, I didn't work. What? Karen? The new one has been here for like a month. Yes, that one. Okay, so as I see in your record, you have a bunch of vacation time. And with a three-month quit period, I make it that you work here for the next... Uh, only today. <sighs> Go to the IT guys and put back the computer you have. Sure, right away. I go back to my space and set up a quick deleting process to make sure the hard drive is empty for the new colleague and call the IT guys to come take my computer. They arrived in five minutes with PM. It was around 9 a.m. Hey, RP, this is a computer? Yes. Are you able today? I point on the resignation in the note from HR that says I can only stay one more hour in the office. I'm just leaving, as Karen asked me. Who will deliver? Not me. OP, can you share the access information with Kevin? Kevin's the new guy. Not very clever. 
Well, I'm not allowed to share anything like that, since it was my access. And how would it look if I used it after my resignation? Do you have anything on the computer? Is it safe? No, I purged it before you arrived. Okay, sure, I will ask Karen about the delivery. No problem, be fine, OP. I am fine, have a nice life. Just when I went around, Kevin looked at me with a smile. You're fired, you bastard. Next time, consider that you shouldn't try to go to a manager position, because you're just a loser. When I left around 9.30, Karen wasn't in the office yet. I just smiled back and left. A colleague, who was leaving a week later from the same position, sent me a message the same day. Kevin is delivering the bank. Nobody knows how. To my knowledge, Karen was loudly arguing, running around the office, trying to make things get done. But after eight hours without lunch, she left the office too, at 6pm. Which seems to me to be a little out of policy, because she arrived at 10am, but who cares. Side note. As I had friends in work, I have some info about what happened after my leaving. It happened years ago, and I can say they survived. PM resigned as quick as I did, and left the company due to company troubles, too, he became some nice office manager in a different company. Karen was a manager for three months, and then she moved to a different city with her boyfriend to earn much more than she did. She became a professional mother. Kevin, who took my position, cost the company thousands of dollars in penalties because he was inexperienced. He once dropped the whole bank database of customers and transactions, there is a backup, but recovery makes it unavailable from hours to days. A lot of people without money on their cards. The company still exists. Different people working there. I don't want to say they were bad people, but their imagination and experience about how things should work were radically different from my own. After that, I worked for three more companies, and I left them quickly, too. Like two years for a company, at which I eventually realized... Some managers were micromanagers, and I'm not talking about their height. And because I'm bad at going on vacation, I drop resignation as quick as my badge. Companies here do not like to pay extra money. Now, I work for a nicer company, starting in my third year. We have some problems, but the people are great here. Fingers crossed, and a nice life to you all. Two... Context. I had just moved across the country to the west coast of the U.S. and started high school at a hybrid homeschool. Think a college-like schedule, but with school-at-home parents and a nursery to accommodate the babies they brought. I had been in Montessori, charter, private Catholic, magnet, and just regular old public school, so I stood out like a sore thumb to my classmates who had been homeschooled since, well, forever. The other girl in this story was one of those kids, Betty. We had gotten along pretty well. We sat together in a few core classes, and both had an interest in creative writing. I was pretty decent at drawing at the time, and still doodle pretty regularly. This caught her attention, and pretty soon we had a relationship with her stashing away the loose-leaf drawings I didn't want, which was fine by me, as it was mutual. But as most artists can tell you, some people get a little too comfortable with requests and start to get pushy. Betty and I were both in the after-school theater program, and rehearsals took a long time, especially when you were a background character waiting for your cue. So I had my sketchbook and began drawing some old original characters, a married couple just interacting in general. Now Betty really, really loved these characters, she thought they were adorable. At this point, I think she had about 30 different pages of drawings of characters from this series. So when she asked me to draw some more, I didn't mind and made a quick sketch of them hugging. She tilts her head at it, like she's content with it but expected more. She hands it back to me and asks if I could make more. I was already on another set of characters from this series, so I told her I would once I finished this other doodle. The moment I put the pen down, she asks if I'm done, and if I can make her more. I just accepted it as enthusiasm for my work, but it irked me a little that she couldn't wait a bit longer. So I make her another drawing, and she makes the same request for more. 
After about three more drawings, I finally had it. You want these two characters interacting so bad, I'll give it to you. A little thing about Betty is that she came from a very religious background, and many of her classmates at the homeschool did too. Certain topics were just not discussed in the open with a blasé attitude. I, however, hung out with the otaku, Fujoshi, furry fangirls while at public school, which meant lots and lots of hentai, yaoi, yuri, etc. exposure. That combined with very literal and rational parents. Sex was just a typical run-of-the-mill occurrence. We eat, we drink, we sleep, and we fuck. And if you're married, you presumably fuck your partner. I think you can all see where this is going. With a smile, I take the paper back, fold a small corner so she and myself could hide it easily, and proceed to draw the wife getting Dick TF down. Lots of detail in all the right places. Ayaga face, sweat drops, and all the sound effects around them. Took about a minute. I handed it back to her and went, Here, I hope you like this one. Her look of excitement quickly fades and she goes silent. I felt a little bad as I remember she's not used to explicit things like me. So I go back to drawing. We finish up rehearsals, go home, and that was it. The next day during class break, Betty comes up to me and sheepishly goes, If you're not busy, would you be able to draw something for me, please? I smiled and replied, I'm not busy at all, and thank you for asking. What would you like? Betty and I have been best friends for nearly seven years. 3. I am a dryliner, which means I do a lot of moving around for my trade, as most of the work I do is toward the end of most projects. This means that I spend a lot of time renting flats and houses for only short periods, usually about six months at a time. This has meant that I have had to deal with a lot of landlords over the years, both good and bad. When it comes to the bad landlords, I will normally just walk away and get on with moving to the next job, and take the loss of my deposit, and never use them again if I'm working in that area in the future. But this particular landlord got my back up so badly, I was not just going to walk away. I managed to get myself onto a big job in London, working on the new Wembley Stadium, so I decided I would look for a house to rent rather than a flat, as I know I was going to be working on it for a while and found a reasonably priced, for London, house to rent from a private landlord in a local newspaper. I gave him a call and meet with him later that day. He seemed okay. Went to view the house, paid him the deposit, cash, and moved in that weekend. I ended staying in the house for nearly a year with no problems. Always had the rent paid into his bank account on time, and fixed any small problems that might crop with the house myself without bothering him. Up to the time when it came to moving out, I only ever spoke to him twice on the phone, after there was an issue with the heating that I was unable to fix myself, and he sent an engineer round the next day to fix the boiler. Come the time that the job was finishing, I went round to the pawn shop that he owned to give him notice that I would be moving out the following month, and to let him know that I was happy for him to come round to inspect the house before I moved out, so that I could get my deposit back from him when I returned the keys. He never came round while I was in to inspect the house, so I assumed that he had come round and let himself in while I was at work, as I had told him that I had no issue with him doing that if need be. So on the day I moved out, I went around the shop and handed him his keys back and asked for my deposit. His response was, What deposit? The month's rent that I gave you in advance of moving in as a security deposit, I replied. He then told me he was keeping that to cover the cost of repairing damages caused while I was living in the property. I responded, What damages? With the bits of work and decorating that I had done to the house, it was in a better state now than when I had moved into it. His response was to step forward and get right up in my face and say, You're not getting it back, so fuck off. He then gave me a shove which needed me to take three steps back to avoid falling on my arse. Now I am what you would class as average size and build, and this landlord has a good four inches on me height-wise, and obviously spent some time down the gym and the wise move would be to back away and cut my losses. Now, before I was a builder, I was a member of the British Army in a regiment called the Royal Green Jackets, and they had trained us that the best way to proceed when confronted with aggression is to meet it swiftly and with much more violent aggression. 
So, without even thinking about it, I started to move forward with the full intention of dropping this twat quickly and painfully. After the first step, though, a thought popped into my head like a bolt from the blue. So I stopped and took a moment to examine the idea from a few different angles and said, Okay, bye, to my now ex-landlord and walked out of his shop. What the landlord did not know is that I had a spare backdoor key cut when I had lived in the house, which I had stashed in my van in case I ever lost a key so I could still get back in. So later that evening, I let myself back in and decided to stop for one last night before leaving in the morning for my next job, which was in Scotland. I spent the last night in my house carefully removing every bit of wood in there. I took down doors, removed skirting boards, banisters, architrave, and floorboards, being extremely careful not to damage anything. I also completely dismantled all the kitchen units, took up the wood flooring and carpets. I then left everything in neat piles in each room. I got in my van and left the next morning, and was preparing to start my drive when I decided I wanted to rub a little more salt into my ex-landlord's wounds. So I stopped at his shop on the way out of London, got a spare hammer, screwdriver, bag of nails, and a box of wood screws at the back of my van, and went into the shop. My ex-landlord was not there, probably for the best, so I left the tools with his confused-looking assistant, and told her to tell her boss, you will be needing these, and left for my drive north. I had my phone switched off while driving, and a few hours later, while I was having a bite to eat in a service station up by Nottingham, I decided to switch it back on, and was greeted by a string of text messages and some very colourful voicemails, which left me chuckling to myself. I did reply to one of the texts he sent me. The text was, Do you think you're fucking funny, leaving me nails and screws? I responded, Yes. 4. I was working as a technical writer for a software company that had contracts across a number of business types. Everything from government utilities to military simulation. As such, I ended up tasked by several teams in the company, each one needing my immediate attention in generating user's guides and documentation for their projects. My bosses only had to, Bob and Bob, also needed me to assist them in writing proposals for various contracts that they were bidding on. This led to me constantly being pulled in multiple directions at once, as everyone needed me to finish their project yesterday. I was working until late in the night sometimes to finish vital projects that they just had to have. The final straw came after listening to one of the programming teams bitch me out for failing to update the user's guide for a software update that they had only finished the day before. And one of my bosses called me into his office to chew me out for failing to complete his proposal that he kept making changes to at 11pm the night it was due to be submitted. Oh, and our office manager had left for maternity leave, so our penny-pinching bosses figured I could do her tasks like answering phones, buying office supplies, and entering time cards in my copious spare time. When he told me sternly that I would need to learn to manage my work time better, I finally snapped. Malicious compliance powers activate. I came in on Sunday and posted a huge magnetic whiteboard behind my desk that was visible as you walked into my office. I made colored magnetic labels with each project I was currently doing, who had assigned the task and the due date of each. I also put a column of numbers 1 through 20 along the side. I then placed each task in order of due date. I came in early that morning. And as usual, each team lead came into my office to ask the status of their tasking of me. I pointed behind me at my board and said I am currently working on tasks 1 and 2. If you think your task takes priority, I'm going to need written permission from the people above you to move your task above theirs. There were a lot of unhappy people that morning. <laughs> Eventually, the bosses sauntered in and came into my office after listening to all the teams bitching to them about me ignoring their projects. They both came into my office, and before they said anything, I pointed behind me. All I said was, I'm currently juggling 18 projects and the job of the full-time office manager. I can only work on so many things simultaneously. If you think that any of my projects are out of priority order, let me know. Otherwise, leave me alone. The two of them stared at the board for about five minutes before leaving. An hour later, they came in, 
and said they didn't realize the amount of work each of the teams was throwing on my plate because each team thought I had plenty of time to spare. <sighs> I wish I could say I got a raise or an attaboy. But by the end of the day, six teams were pulled from my board and given back to the programming teams. Oh, and my bossies hired a temp to take care of the phones and time cards until our office manager returned. I'm no longer with that company. It closed its doors several years back when it failed to win enough new contracts to keep the lights on. And please don't think my bosses were assholes. They were just unaware that other teams were throwing items on my plate. One of my bosses was a really decent guy, for example, later that year, when the engine blew in my car and I was having trouble financing a new vehicle. My boss paid my down payment out of his own pocket, so the financing worked out. 5. Here is a bit of backstory. I just bought my house at the age of 27. I'm still so new to all of this, so when my mortgage company told me not to open any new lines of credit or even run a credit check, I listened. This was around the same time my company was launching an initiative to have company cards sent to their outside reps. Note, it was optional, until it wasn't. So my company offers to pay for flights, but they also offer to pay for mileage if you drive. Maybe you can see where this is going. I was asked to fill out a form to qualify for a company credit card. I didn't want to because of my closing, but I knew I would have to eventually. I downloaded the form from Outlook and let it sit on my desktop. Now, we didn't have our own manager at the time, so another region's manager asked me to fill it out. I politely declined at the time, because house, and in between then and now, our company finally hired our own manager for our region. Our new manager, Sam, was recommended and hired by our zone manager, manager's manager. So everything they do has to be by the books. Well, about four months after declining a company credit card, the managers were told that it's no longer optional. Nobody relayed this to the reps who still didn't have a card, including me. So when the time came to buy flight tickets for a national meeting, I used my personal card. Well, this set off a chain reaction behind the scenes. Apparently, zone manager pulled all managers into a meeting and informed them that buying tickets with personal cards was grounds for a write-up. I was threatened with a write-up and was given this rejection comment on my expense report. OP still has not sent information for company card despite multiple times asked last fall by substitute manager and last week by Sam. Multiple times last fall. Show me the paper trail. That's when I decided to cancel my $350 to our flight. If my company isn't paying me back, there's no way I'm dropping that much money on my own. Q malicious compliance. I canceled my flight and drove. The 12 hours it took by car totaled way more than $350. I stayed at the fanciest hotel at the halfway mark and pocketed close to a grand in mileage expense. Keep your stinking company card. Now, I would later find out that corporate credit cards may not affect your credit. Except they also might. There seems to be a lot of confusion and contradiction on that. But I did give the closing as a reason for declining the card, and not one person batted an eye at it. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Revenge is Ice Cream, episode 122. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. If you enjoyed the video, then please do comment, like, subscribe, and, um, pancakes, make pancakes. Now, if you're having pancakes... What do you do to them? That sounded naughty. Anyway, what do you do to them? Do you like to put syrup on them? Are you, you, are you one of those wacky Nutella people? Do you like fruit with your pancakes? Or do you not like pancakes at all? Do you like them small? Do you like them large? Do you like them thick? Do you like them thin? I want pancakes now. I really should stop talking about food in these outros. I was just talking in the Discord there and I made myself want Chinese gravy with steak, chips and mushrooms. And now I want it again. <sighs> what are you doing to me, man? Stop it. Plenty of food there. I've got groceries today. I just don't have those particular things. Well, okay, anyway. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening. And take very good care of yourself.